Hi, I'm Robert Hooks, and welcome to the Urban Roundtable. Joining me is a true legend in the television news industry. In a career that spanned more than 50 years, he retired in 2009 as vice president of NBC News, and many thought him to be the person that the fabled newscaster Lou Grant from the Mary Tyler Moore Show was based on. And there's a whole lot more. But first, allow me to introduce the man himself, Mr. Robert Long. Robert, welcome to the round table. Pleasure to be here, sir. <laughs> Uh, 2009, you retired. I did. I uh, went off to Istanbul, one of my favorite cities, um, to uh, uh, teach at a university there. Okay. Um, journalism, which is a kind of a new concept in, in, in that region, um, and to help a university start a film program. Mm -hmm. And after seven or eight months, my work was done there. And I came back, and I'm I'm bored. Bored. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I'm I'm glad not to be doing what I was doing. Uh, I was a news director for a long time, but I've had parallel careers over the years. I've done movies. I've done entertainment television. I've worked with actors and and anchormen, and sometimes there's not much difference. You produce these and things. produce. Um, uh, the last film I did was um, with George Hamilton and Robert Conrad, and that was so much fun. I'd, yeah. I'd like to squeeze in another one before um, I hang it up for good. I don't see why you can't. Let me read something, okay? Mm -hmm. I, the audience is going get, to get a kick out of that, this. When you retired, some people talked about you. Uh, the man was like a basketball player who was always around the ball. Uh, but had no one, uh, but no one knew uh, what position he played <laughs> or what team he was on. First, there was the Castro thing. We can talk about that. Then the stuff about uh, meeting uh, with Khrushchev, and then he was uh, at Time Magazine with. Uh, he was at Time Magazine when Kennedy was murdered. My goodness, you've been all over the place. And showed up at Yale with George Bush. <laughs> he was. We didn't in the, travel in the same circles. <laughs> I'm sure you didn't. I know about you, buddy. Uh, he was in the Vietnam thing. It was an advisor to a Marine general who was killed in action. And uh, and then he shows up in the Congo with Mobutu and in uh, Beirut during the Civil War. I mean, it goes on and on. Uh, t tell me, uh, and that's a lot to, to, to handle, but uh, did you always want to do this kind of stuff? I, I never saw it. It just sort of happened. And it it began with Castro, and I was in the ninth grade in your hometown, Washington D.C. And I was essentially flunking out. I wasn't going to go much beyond Tacoma Park Junior High School. <laughs> and but I had a good life. I delivered the Washington Post in the morning, and the Evening Star in the afternoon, and I was a fry cook and a greasy spoon at lunchtime. And I was helping my mother cover the rent and my kid sister and. I thought this was the way it was going to play out. And this teacher said, look, if you don't go to high school, you're going to make your mother cry. Mm -hmm. Now when they pull that on, guys. <laughs> so I said, okay, what do I have to do? She said, you got to do a special paper, I'll get you a D, you'll move on to <laughs> Montgomery Blair. And. Uh, I chose the Cuban Revolution. This was uh, the winter of 58, 59. Mm -hmm. And Fidel and his boys were coming out of the, mountains, out of the mountains, moving on Havana. And people don't realize what a hero he was to young people all over the world. He was fighting the system, he sure. was fighting the man. And, you know, the U.S. and the Mafia <laughs> had teamed up to. Uh, keep a, a, a terrible dictator, Fulgencio Batista, in power. Yes, yes. And I think my generation, we, were, we didn't know what we were talking about, but we, uh, we were kind of rooting for the underdog. Sure. So he was a romantic figure. And, of course, I never really got around to doing any legitimate research, but I, as I'm delivering the Washington Post one morning, I see he's coming to town to meet Eisenhower, right. meet President Eisenhower. And um, try to work out a deal with the United States. Right. You know, he beat us fair and square. I remember it. And so I, I went downtown, mm -hmm. excuse to skip another day of school, 
downtown to uh, 16th and P Street, where the uh, Cuban embassy was, and I watched him come and go and uh, followed him around. And about 5 o'clock, they buttoned him up in the embassy. I figured that was the end of the day, and I had enough um, uh, atmosphere <clears throat> to fill a paper. Right. And I went around a corner to uh, a Spanish bar and ordered beer. I was 14, but this is the South. And you I were a big 14. <laughs> and I, I've sounded like this since I was five years old. Oh, okay. <laughs> so if you got, in the South, in those days, if you had a, a suit on and <laughs> you could belly up to the bar, you'd get a, a beer. And there was this fellow sitting next to me. And every time he leaned forward, I could see the butt of a revolver mm -hmm. under his arm. And on the second beer, I said, uh, what's up with the gat? He said, oh, I got one over here, too. <laughs> this guy turns out to be Castro's personal bodyguard, later chief of the secret police in Cuba, mm -hmm. in Cuba. a man named Rojo. And uh, he tells me all this, and he says, uh, the boss has sent me out to invite some women to a party, find some ladies. We've been in the mountains a long time. <laughs> We're having a party tonight. Where can I find some women? I'm 14. If I knew where to find him, I wouldn't know what to do with him. <laughs> wouldn't right? know what to do with him. <laughs> but I told him what I thought I knew. <laughs> and he said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came to see your boss. He said, you guys will hit it off. Come back tomorrow, and I'll introduce you to Fidel. I come back in the morning. Mm -hmm. Whatever I told him must have worked, because he's shooing a couple of ladies out of the industry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and he said, come on in, come on. Well, the short of it is, for the next four days, we were the three musketeers. It was Fidel, Rojo, and me. And you. I was the wheel man. <laughs> when the cops... Not the pimp, the wheel man. <laughs> the wheel man. <laughs> right. when, when the cops put Fidel to bed, he'd wait an hour and sneak out. He was a night owl. Uh -huh. I took him around the Washington that I knew. Um, he wanted to see the cultural center of the city, and, mm -hmm. and in those days it was 14th and U Streets. Yes, know it well. The Harlem of Washington. And about 11 o'clock one night, we, Fidel wants some American cigars. I said, are you sure? <laughs> 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 we don't make really good. You make good cigars. You make, good, you make the says, best. No, I'm in America. I should be smoking American cigars. Oh, wow. So we stop at this liquor store on 14th Street. And Fidel's in his uniform. He's in his fatigues, his right. trademark. Trademark. Green. Right. And he's six foot three. Big guy. Uh, big beard. And he's uh, Rojo was the pistolero. And, and me and we walk into this bar, and this old guy behind the counter said, I know you. <laughs> <laughs> and Fidel said, I'd like some cigars. He said, Well, uh, are you sure you want? White Owls. <laughs> we hear yours are pretty My good. God. White Owls. <laughs> so uh, the guy behind the counter hands him a box of nickel cigars. Fidel has a, a pocket full of Havanas. He oh, passes geez. over. He doesn't carry money. He doesn't know what that is. And the, um, the guy behind the counter gave him a Zippo with the name of the liquor store on it. Okay. That Fidel carried the rest of his time in the United States. Wow. Um, and it was quite an adventure. The short of it is that um, I, it, that was so much fun. I just kept doing stuff like that. Wow. And eventually I found out I could be paid for it. <laughs> <laughs> so I sort of became a journalist accidentally. Right, right. Uh, now, now, I want to I bounce back because uh, the, let's deal with, I want to deal with the, with the Khrushchev thing. But, but, uh, but now, what about this Lou Grant thing? I mean, were you really the model for that guy? No, uh, but I was part of the, the model was an amalgam, like like all things. Right, sure. um, uh, I have a photograph in my cell phone of um, this woman in a sailor suit looking over my shoulder while I'm typing away furiously in the Channel Two newsroom here in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. um, this would have been about 1971, 72, and I had just become the city editor mm -hmm. at uh, Channel Two. And she was a copy girl. I had no idea mm. this was Mary Todd Moore. But she was following me around, mm. kept grinning at me like a loon, wore these sailor suits, 
<laughs> and was giving me the willies. And I went to the news director and I said, the Chief, um, this girl's a little long in the tooth for this kind of entry-level stuff. And right. she's creeping me out. Right. Says, uh, son, uh, how long were you in Vietnam? Mm -hmm. In the Marines. I said, not long. Mm -hmm. She said, head wound, anything like that? I said, no. Mm -hmm. You don't know who that is? I said, no. <laughs> Well, you, you didn't find know. out, and uh, you do what she says. <laughs> uh, Mary Tyler Moore's uh, uh, aunt was our business manager, a woman named Bertie Hackett. Mm -hmm. And Bertie had suggested to Mary she do a show based on our newsroom because it was full of these characters, Jerry Dunphy and, uh, you know, from the desert to the sea. Sure, I remember Jerry. And... Pete Noyes was the, uh, uh, Pete would change his title every day or two. <laughs> Pete is still around, a uh, legendary news guy. Um, one day he'd call himself managing editor, the next day he'd be the executive right. producer, whatever he felt like that. Whatever. And <clears throat> Pete uh, smoked cigars. Um, newsrooms in those days had spittoons. Oh, jeez. Um, everybody smoked constantly. There were two women in every newsroom. The woman's reporter, okay. Ruth Ashton Taylor, in this case, okay, and the news director's secretary. Mm -hmm. That was it. That was it. The rest of it was a gym, <laughs> a locker room. <laughs> smelled like one too. <laughs> smelled with like cigarettes one. and yeah. Um, and Pete was constantly setting fire to trash cans. He'd throw his cigar butt in there, and it would still be smoking. <laughs> All of a sudden, you kind of bang into stuff, and he'd get upset with a rider and push him around. Um, and most of us who were editors kept a bottle of booze in our desk. Mm -hmm. This was the late 60s, early 70s, riots in the streets. Sure. We'd taken all our windows out because we kept getting bomb threats. Um, <clears throat> and I think um, Mary and her, uh, Bert Prelutsky, the writer-producer of the show, who was also in the newsroom for several weeks pretending to be a news writer, not a particularly good one, as yeah. I recall, um, absorbed this atmosphere, and Lou Grant's probably a combination of me and, and Pete and, and right. several other characters. In those days, um, newsrooms were right. full of characters. Right. Wow, that's amazing. Now, um, I also wanted to to find out from you. Uh, well, I want to jump forward because you're a newsman, even though you're retired. Mm -hmm. Give me your thoughts about. For instance, this whole Republican primary fiasco that's going on. What, what are your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I feel bad for the Republicans uh, because I, I have known and covered some progressive Republicans over the years, and um, uh, they were the, the, the sane party uh, when the lefties captured the Democratic Party and the Republicans were making sense. Well, the Republicans have been hijacked. Yes. By, by the religious right. Oh, jeez. And are making absolutely no sense. Uh, it, it's as though every Republican had closed the book on economics, on common sense, and, uh, and is simply trying to bring down the current administration. Uh, Very hard trying. I have never seen in 50 years of, of growing up covering politics in Washington, I've never seen this. The, depth of bitterness and anger. Amazing. Absolutely um, amazing. It's disheartening. Yeah, it's disheartening now. You know, it's funny what's happening, though, and I'm kind of enjoying it myself, being a liberal, you know, and I have no bones about what I am. Uh, I'm looking at Newt Gingrich throwing bombs like crazy at Mitt Romney. I mean... Well, that's <laughs> all I can do now. <laughs> and they're saying, Newt, stop already. And Newt said, no, 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 no. Remember Iowa? <laughs> Well, Newt has always been a, um, uh, a loose cannon. Um, and, <laughs> to say and, the least. And part of what was fun, um, and his importance, you know, he, he is, along with Dick Cheney, one of the two conservatives in our time who have had the most impact on what's happened to the Republican Party and to this country, for good or ill. Uh, I think ill, but go ahead. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't dispute that. <laughs> uh, um, and I can't explain that phenomenon. 
Uh, I think that Newt actually believes, like Dostoevsky, mm. I think to be a great writer you have to think that everything that comes out of your mouth or onto the page is original and brilliant. And most uh, most of what Dostoevsky wrote was dribble, but some was some was brilliant. some was brilliant. Yeah, I, I I think our friend Newt is the Dostoevsky of modern Republican politics, and he actually believes that he's yeah. an intellectual. He's not. He's an anti-intellectual. Anti-intellectual. And how's this thing going to end? I mean, it's going to end with Obama having a second term. Yeah, right. Being wiser. Uh, now, mm -hmm. it takes a while to learn this job. It does. Look, and four years is not a long time in that building, and in that place. Here, here came a candidate four years ago, three years ago, who uh, thought he could collaborate in Washington <laughs> at exactly the wrong time. Yeah. Collaboration is what governing is about. Yes, absolutely. Um, but not at the moment. Um, so you had the. Um, the guy who wanted to bring people together coming into Washington at exactly the wrong time mm -hmm. when it was divisive and got even more so there are people who simply cannot stand the thought of him in the White House. Absolutely. And let me, and, and let me just say this, uh, that my brother said to me uh, not, not long ago, because uh, we were talking about uh, how the Republicans had just stopped everything. They just, you know, they're obstructionists, right? And he said it's like the white kid down the block who goes to college, the white Republican kid, goes to college, falls in love with this guy, brings this guy back home, the parents are in, brings the guy in, and he's a black guy. And right. there's his parents is going. Guess who's coming for dinner. Guess who's coming for dinner. They can't stand the fact that this man is in the White House and the fact that he's not done such a bad job. I mean, you know, like you said. He's, he's actually had an amazing run. Uh, you know, I was I was sad to see uh, because I you know I contribute a few bucks to candidates and so forth, so sure. I get I get mail and then to some Republican candidates. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm not a strict uh, one party guy, but I got a mailer from the Obama campaign just yesterday, mm -hmm. and I was distressed that it was in the form of here's what to tell people who say Obama hasn't done anything. These are the things he's done. Mm -hmm. It's distressing because we shouldn't need a uh, teleprompter to tell us what this man has done. His legislative record in the first two years equaled that of Lyndon Johnson, one of the great presidents of the 20th oh, century yeah. in terms of civil rights and so forth, and getting things through Congress. He was the master yeah, puppeteer. He was. Yes, he was. He and was tough. Ob Obama. Um, uh, facing a hostile uh, Congress for most of his administration, yeah. has been able to do some remarkable things. Yeah. But nobody seems to pay attention to that. Well, but you know, you say that list, and you know, I mean, there are a lot of people that just don't know his accomplishments. Right. And I've always, I, I've even said to a lot of people, go online, go to whitehouse.gov, and just check out the accomplishments. There are lists of them, 150 of them, right? And, you know, don't listen to the noise about the fact that he's not accomplished anything. Right. But anyway. Uh, and uh, the First Lady has to appear on television and explain why she's not an angry black woman. Yeah. That's what crazy. have we come to yeah. when the debate, the national debate, is over whether the First Lady is an angry black woman? Yeah, yeah. And, and the president uh, is not an American. Yeah, well, how crazy. And he's a secret Muslim yeah, right. terrorist. What is that yeah. about? What is your feeling about, if you know about these two guys, um, uh, Professor Cornell West and, and Tavis Smiley uh, are black guys that are, you know, very bright, intelligent, right. Right. Inte part of the intelligentsia, but have really kind of rubbed the black community and a lot of the communities the wrong way with their take on Obama. Do you know anything about these two guys? Only, you know, what I read. Uh, I've met Tavis. I have not met the professor. Mm -hmm. um, I think generally it is a good thing to stir stuff up. Mm -hmm. I think it is a good thing to be controversial within your class and race and faith and, you know, to, um, we don't want to see a bunch of robots on there. Right. Uh, the professor, I think, is 
a bit of a demagogue, mm -hmm. and professors can be that way. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. They aren't supposed to throw ideas out and be challenged and then fight back. Davis is uh, a television personality. Yes. And, um, intelligent man. Inte very intelligent yeah. guy. Uh, Boy, have they rubbed the black community the wrong way. Well, you tell me. What's your take? Well, on? you know, I just think uh, I like them both. I don't mm -hmm. know the prof Well, I do. I know them both. I, I, I don't know them well. Uh, I think that they're kind of um, off on the wrong foot as it relates to explaining themselves as to why they're saying and doing what they're doing. It, you know, and uh, well, anyway, I, I just think that they're 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 really basically um, wrong in their well, assumptions of they, what the president's been all about. There are a couple of couple of columnists that I follow. Um, one's a Nobel laureate in economics, and I, I agree with a lot of what he has to say, and he is constantly defending this um, administration. He's, he's, he criticizes it as well, but sure. he, he has become strident, mm -hmm. just like the opposition. Now you've got smart people <clears throat> saying dumb things at the top of their lungs. <laughs> um, this is not good for the uh, country. It's not good for us as a culture. Uh, when our intellectuals, right and left, um, are at each other's throats. Mm. And when discussion ends um, and you, you take these hard positions on things. Yeah. It's you're not the way it's supposed to be. Yeah. You're, you're, you're a newsman, despite the fact that you're retired, as I said. What is your take on how the news and the cable news, the network news and the cable news, uh, the news for, for, for profit uh, thing. How, how do you think they're handling this, covering this? Well, I spent most of my time in, in television news, started out in print. Um, and I came into television when it was not for profit, mm -hmm. when it was public service, and it was required. Uh, people who held broadcast licenses to do public service. That's no longer required. The Reagan administration took care of that. Amazing. As well as cutting subsidies to the arts. <laughs> Here's an actor who's president of the United States and, and cutting, cutting subsidies, subsidies to the arts. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, the worst thing that ever happened to us in television news is that we started to make money. Mm -hmm. And that was in the early 70s, and it was with <clears throat> the war in Vietnam, the first television war and the Watergate scandal. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, huge audiences are watching the show. Uh, there weren't many newscasts. Um, Los Angeles was the first city to have an hour-long newscast. It was called The Big News in 1963. Mm -hmm. And it ran until 1975 with Jerry Dunphy. Mm -hmm. And that newscast, I'm told by a professor of television at UCLA, was the single most profitable program CBS ever wow. produced, and that includes All in the Family, mm. MASH. It's a, really? It generated more revenue over its lifespan than any program CBS ever did. Wow. Well, everyone's looking at that and saying, well, we got to have one of those, too. Mm-hmm and television stations that used to do Captain Carrot in the morning and have a cooking show and at midday and something in the afternoon who created local programming. Mm -hmm. Stopped doing that and started doing news and imitating what they thought a, a newscast was. So quality began to decline even as the base brought. Mm -hmm. That was the first crisis. We began to make money so it was too important to be left in the hands of journalists. Now, marketing people had to come right. in, MBAs had to come in, lawyers had to come in. Nothing wrong with any of those people, right. but they don't know jack don't know about covering a story. <laughs> uh, it's just another show yeah. to them. So we went through a down period. Uh, you know how cyclical our industry is. Sure. And after the awful 80s, 
sort of the nadir of quality in this country and, and broadcast. I agree with theater that. Theater and film. We were coming out of this fairly nicely and into the 90s and had rediscovered journalism and the importance of telling good stories. And at CBS, which had largely self-destructed, somebody said, uh, hey, we got a show on Sunday that's getting these huge ratings. And this is where we put all the burnouts and the, the, the hard, hard cases that we couldn't handle. And it was called 60 Minutes. I know where you're going, right. And they put these guys in the basement and left them alone for 10 years <laughs> <laughs> because they were essentially unmanageable characters. Right, right. And some of them Don were Don Hewitt and his boys. Don Hewitt, who was born to be a carnival barker. <laughs> oh, really? I mean, that, that's what he was. Yeah, you know, yeah. Um, was put in charge of this little asylum of burnouts and hard cases. <laughs> but the network forgot about it for 10 years, and all of a sudden, it's a hit. It's a hit. And still is. Still is. All these years. Um, <laughs> so that was the salient going into the 90s. Along comes the Internet. And the new panic was no one is watching. In 2009, when I retired from NBC here, between 5 and 7 p.m., yeah. prime news watching time, in the second largest market in the country, <clears throat> mm. available to watch English language news, two rating points. Wow. That's all that was available. Uh. A rating point is a percentage of the total universe of television sets. Two percent mm. were available out of the hundred percent of television <laughs> audience to watch English language news. Uh -huh. And four of us were doing it. Wow. So I had a newscast once and I, I, I had a study done of that this particular day. The median age of my audience was seventy. <laughs> Half of the audience was over 70. <laughs> and 25,000 people were watching a 5 p.m. newscast. Mm. 25,000. Mm. You, you get a bigger audience with a megaphone. Right. right? <laughs> so clearly people had gone somewhere else. Right. <laughs> uh, the holy grail of broadcasting has always been 18 to 40. Yeah, that's well, what advertisers, 35 to 40, advertisers yeah. don't care about us because we're going to buy another Buick anyway. <laughs> right. We, our habits are set. They can't influence us. Right. Okay. If you look at advertising on a network newscast now, it's erectile dysfunction, <laughs> hemorrhoids, uh, health insurance, you know. <laughs> because we're the only people watching. You know? <laughs> our age group, the only people who watch. If I, if I see another Cialis commercial, I go <laughs> <Right>. crazy. <laughs> yeah, people in hot tubs, you know, oh, old people. And they're on every three and minutes. They, they are, because they know our attention span <laughs> isn't what it used to be. So uh, not wanting to target that audience any further, the quest began for the kids, and they were on the web. Now... All decisions about what people want to see are made by middle-aged white men, mm -hmm. generally. Still, mm -hmm. even though women have come a long way, and in television, maybe a handful of people of color, still, maybe, still way, yeah. way behind every other industry oh, yeah. I have any knowledge of. Yeah. My my good friend Paula Madison fought for years to get more. Uh, color into television and um, was largely unsuccessful. Well, not, not because of her efforts, but yeah. um, so you got forty-something white guys trained by General Electric mm. at NBC deciding what eighteen-year-olds want to see on TV. They don't watch news. <laughs> <laughs> if they read a newspaper, it's the Wall Street right. Journal. If it right. Um, so all of these newscasts became suddenly kid shows. Mm. It was the bimbo du jour. It was uh, you know the foibles of um, uh, a drug-addled young actor. Uh, right. The low-hanging fruit. Right. This is the easy stuff to right. get. There, there is a kind of journalism that deals with celebrities, but. 
It's a minor uh, chord. It became the major chord. And because people like me, people like you, mm -hmm. are expensive and difficult, you know, because we've done this for a while, we think we know what we're doing. <laughs> you said so expensive. Tend, Did you say expensive? <laughs> expensive. I mean, you've got to pay us. We've been around for a while. <laughs> okay. We're not doing this to make our bones. <laughs> our bones are made. Kind of talk to my producer. <laughs> <laughs> talk to my producer. Well, there's also charity. And, you know, <laughs> I do a lot of that. <laughs> Good works. I do a lot of that here. <laughs> we have fun, though. Well, this is payback. Yeah. This is payback. Because somebody spent time with us. We should spend time with Sure. Um, but the notion, uh, my, my, my favorite horror of the current age is the notion of citizen journalism. And I actually had a senior executive say, look, everybody's got a cell phone that takes high definition pictures and we can get our news that way. Citizen journalists are out there, we don't have to pay them. Mm. This is the capitalist dream. Mm -hmm. A steady stream of revenue, no employees, right. it's all mine. Right? <laughs> it's the dream. It's America's dream. Is he okay in there? <laughs> um, so I said to this guy, I said, uh, you know, when you go back to New York, I hear you. And you go up to the counter at American Airlines, you demand a citizen pilot. Mm. <laughs> right. See, I, this guy, give him the 747 and take me back to New York. And when you feel that little chest pain, <laughs> say, give me a citizen surgeon. Here, I got a, I got a Swiss Army knife. See if you can fix it. Citizen surgeon, I love it. Well, the notion of citizen journalism, obviously, is goofy. It worked in, 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 the, in the whole uh, uh, um, uh, Arab Spring. I mean, you know, that, that, well, that's... Well, communication. That was communication. And... You know, video is easy to get now. Mm -hmm. uh, the cameras we're being photographed with, uh, these aren't $2 million Norelcos that you have to be an artist to paint with and mm -hmm. tubes blow up and all. You can buy these at, at, at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. So everyone has the ability to take a picture. Mm -hmm. But to interpret that, to put it in the context, is what a journalist does. Sure. I mean, just seeing the picture. Uh, you know, and we've all seen the photographs of the Marines allegedly peeing on the uh, dead uh, Taliban. Yes. Um, that screams for some kind of context. As a former Marine, I'm appalled. You know, I, I don't deny this, uh, the, the apparent reality of this. Yeah. Um, Sad chapter. And you see commentary uh, woven around a picture. No one was there. There was no reporter there. Right. Um, there is no one who knows these Marines. There is no one who knows what that engagement was, whether these are uh, dead combatants or civilians. Context yeah. is what the journalist is here to provide. Mm -hmm. Some historical um, reference, uh, um, scale, proportion. And when it's just, you know, the measure of uh, the success of a story is that it goes viral, mm. well, so does cancer. Yes. Yeah. Uh, going viral is not a measure of success. It's just a phenomenon that no one seems to be able to control or manage or mm. engineer, although they, they are trying. Instead of trying for better storytelling, mm -hmm. our businesses are trying to go viral. They may get their wish. <laughs> and this could be a sad day for all. Right, exactly. Well, I, sorry. Do th I do think, I, I, I am hopeful that the, uh, uh, and I think our salvation in, in terms of an intellectual community uh, will come from the very parasites that are drinking our blood at the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, the aggregators who mm -hmm. steal stuff and Oh, distribute it widely, stuff they don't author, they don't stand behind, they don't, um, they just cherry pick yes. and, and put it on a website and people scan it, they don't study it. And, you know, when you read an article in the New York Times, you know what you're getting. Sure. Or the Washington Times, the Mooney newspaper, the right wing newspaper in right. Washington, you know what you're getting. Sure. Wall Street Journal, you know what their yeah, point of view yeah, is. Right. 
when you look at an aggregator's menu, it's you don't, you don't know. You have no context. Right. Well, when the smart parasite realizes that the host is now dying because he's drunk all their blood, he's going to die too. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so the parasite, I think, is the one that's going to reinvent journalism. Okay. Um, <laughs> and I, you'll see le fewer newspapers, fewer newscasts, but that's not a bad thing. There were too many because it became a business mm -hmm. and it had to be replicated until the genre was destroyed. One too many cowboy films and you don't see another for a decade, <laughs> right? Um, TV, newspaper, these are genres. Mm -hmm. You can't have journalism without a newsroom. Um, newsrooms have been destroyed. There are new, a dozen newsrooms in this town that are empty. Empty. Um, okay, they're not going to come back to life. But other newsrooms will spring up and aggregators will help create them because they need blood. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, they will sell their wares to distributors. It'll be a different model. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, People are becoming hungry for a full meal. Right. What What, what is your feeling about <clears throat> cable news? Uh, now I know you were network news right. when you worked uh, okay. your th through your career. Now cable news comes along, and we see it. We see a lot of it. Well, what's your take on uh, on, on on where cable is going to take reporting journalism? Well, right now, it, uh, it, it has shown no distinction at all. Mm. Uh, it began badly with Ted Turner. And Ted inherited a lot of money from his daddy's billboard business. Is that where his money came from? Yeah, right? billboards, right. okay. outdoor advertising. Wow. And he bought a baseball team, so I had something put on TV. And then he married Jane Fonda, which was... CNN. <laughs> yeah, one of the more, most revolting spectacles <laughs> I, have, I have ever seen. Now, as a Vietnam Marine, <laughs> Jane Fonda is not at the top of my head. Right, 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 right. Um, but I was in Santa Monica Canyon one evening in and, and a romantic little restaurant, and there, there are Ted Turner. Ted actually bit my ankle once. What, what do you mean by that? <laughs> he dropped down on the floor and started barking like a dog. <laughs> um, I, I was pitching. He was the vice chairman of... Um, CBS at the time, or was I think it was CBS. I think um, <laughs> my old network. And That's funny. Crazy, yeah. um, brilliant, um, but his newscast, uh, CNN, was was born in the middle of a yacht race. He had hired, and I'm terrible with names, but the, the old CBS correspondent, the Watergate guy, got fired. Uh, over Watergate. Dan uh, Rather? No, no, no. Um, old, old timer. Um, just retired. Uh, CBS, CBS. Oh, okay, okay. You know, uh, Walter right. Cronkite. No, no. Um, he was a network reporter, Cronkite's era. Uh, okay. And the point is that Ted had hired him with a cocktail nap. Wrote his contract out over oh, a drink, <laughs> handed it to him, said, You're now the anchorman. <laughs> For CNN. Oh, wait a I know exactly who you're talking about, but go ahead. I'm sorry. And then Ted went off to race his yacht in the Fastnet, which was, uh, I used to race yachts too. And the Fastnet is a classic race in the Irish Sea. Okay. There was this terrible storm that no one had predicted. A number of sailors lost their lives. Turner's boat was missing. And this was happening at the at the first cable television convention at the same time mm -hmm. in Denver where the announcement of the creation of CNN was to be made by mm. Ted Turner, mm. only he was missing. Turns out he'd wow. been drunk for three days <laughs> in a bar in Ireland. He'd won the race. And go, went to and a bar just and just got drank smashed. himself silly for three days and forgot about this convention. Funny. <laughs> so here's this old CBS news guy who has to get up and explain what cable television is. He had no idea what cable television mm -hmm. was. He just knew he had a job because he had a cocktail napkin on the contract. Mm. That's how it began. Wow. And it hasn't progressed much farther 
<laughs> in all, all these years. Um, it has become a, another genre. The 24-hour news cycle, mm -hmm. where uh, an event is ground to powder, mm -hmm. it's no longer a rock. Mm -hmm. it's, it's talcum powder now. Wow. Has changed our perception of news. It has had prim mostly a negative impact, I think, on. You think? Yeah, on what we call journalism. Now that ain't going to go away. All right. Um, you know, at least MSNBC um, fought back and decided to be liberal well, against the Fox juggernaut. Uh, that's an interesting. But this is entertainment programming, right? What you see on Fox has nothing to do with reality. It's mostly opinion, isn't it? It's show business. Show business. It's a, it's a format. Rupert Murdoch would um, put seals <laughs> and, and monkeys on the set. He has. You know, if it got a number. Sean Hannity. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, okay, so I got the cable picture. I wanted to get your feeling about the juxtaposition of the network and the cable. Uh, and, and you know what? They they don't have numbers. Um, they have enormous influence, disproportionate influence mm -hmm. uh, yes. to their to their audiences. Mm -hmm. I, I think the future, what I, what I see happening, is more local, mm -hmm. local, local. People you, really want to know what's happening in their right. community. You're going to be going to Natby. What, what what are you going to be talking about there? Uh, well, I got a few days to figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell us what that is. I had to come Tell up us with what the title. Is NAPE, N A T P E, National Association of Television Program Executives. Okay. And this has been around since the '60s, and they meet every year. And it used to be a flea market for syndicated. We've, television. we've gone there with our show, as a matter of fact. But go ahead. Well, I mean, I used to produce a show called In Search of with Leonard Nimoy. I remember it. And that was a hugely successful uh, barter reality show, documentary right. show. And it was through uh, conventions like Nappy that you sold your wares to television stations and groups mm -hmm. of stations. Um, I'm not sure what its relevance is today, but I have been asked to speak there about the future of TV news. I'm, I'm going to say pretty much what I what we've been talking about. Well, I'm glad about, you came I, here first. I, <laughs> you're hearing it first here. <laughs> You've got this. I'm actually optimistic. I, I'm hopeful that we will, um, uh, the, the ecosystem can't support crabgrass anymore. Right. You know, the crappy local TV news. I same, like the metaphor. Stuff. Yeah. That'll die. Uh, to survive as a broadcast or a news service. And news services are going to become more important because you're going to reach into your pocket for your smartphone when you have a moment. And you're going to punch up streaming news, get some headlines, whatever. So that's going to be important. Yeah. Yeah. More and more people are doing that every hour of every day. Yeah. So the appetite for information is stronger than ever. Right. To compete, you're going to have to uh, have high quality, uh, high octane fuel mm. for all of these little devices that we carry and now take for granted. It isn't about TV anymore. Mm. Right. Um, I think that will continue. You know, people have counted television out before. Oh, too many times. <laughs> too many times. And it keeps coming back. TV's having a great year. 2012, with the presidential race, these guys are going to be reporting profits of 100 to 150 mm. percent wow. over investment wow. and not spending a dime That's compared to what they spent right, 10 years ago. Right. Uh, people are unemployed, the newsrooms are empty, there's right. no original programming. They're just collecting money now right, in right. a presidential year like this one. A lot uh, of money. Right. Oh, I don't you know. you have a broadcast license. It's a license to print money today. Mm. Uh, will they reinvest? I think some will. Mm -hmm. uh, I think Comcast understands television better than General Electric. Well, they just took NBC and University. They got NBC, and I think they want to compete. Mm -hmm. um, Disney's had uh, a good run. Mm -hmm. CBS has come back. 
after a generation yes. of being lost in the wilderness. Yeah. The Tiffany Network is back. So you can't count TV out, but I think there'll be fewer locally originated newscasts. I think uh, broadcasters will be buying content mm -hmm. from providers. You and I could go set up a newsroom here in Englewood, mm -hmm. um, hire top talent, pay them top dollar, and start doing 60 minutes quality work mm -hmm. and sell it. That's amazing. Amazing. I wanted to back up for a second because you and I share so much in our backgrounds. Mm. We're both from Washington, D.C. We both did a lot of things that, uh, that, that we've talked about. But um, you mentioned the, the, the Leonard Nimoy show. Yeah. What was the title, the exact in title? In Search Of. And, and let me tell you something. Dot, That's dot, really dot. funny, <laughs> right? I did uh, one of the Star Trek movies. I was the commander Morrow in one of the Star, Star Trek oh, three. Of course. Star of course. Trek three. It was called In Search of Spock. Yes. And when you mentioned the Nemo, the show, which right. I remember, uh, I thought that's the ti almost the title from the movie that uh, that Leonard and I, and he directed that. No, he didn't. He didn't direct that one. His but first the, one was The Whale in San Francisco. Yeah, but yeah. But yeah, yeah. But, well, I was working with Leonard, delightful man. Great, wonderful man. Great professional, I learned. He was my first real actor. After uh -huh. leaving TV news for a while and right. doing movies and stuff, he was the guy who taught me what what working great with an actor. Guy. Great like. guy. And uh, uh, Leonard was very wise about the business, and he was Star Trek was over, nothing was happening. He wanted to stay on TV, so he's doing this narration. Thing. Right, right. When Paramount decides to make a movie. The first Star Trek. The first Robert one. Wise is going to Robert direct Wise. it. Okay. Sound of Music. Yes. Great old director. <laughs> Jodfords, you know. Oh, yeah. Uh, he was something. Writing crop. <laughs> um, a guy who did uh, major musicals is going to direct a, a green screen movie. <laughs> you know, where guys with ponytails, right. <laughs> 18 years old, are going to be telling him what to do. <laughs> right. Because you've got to be a tech. Right. right? Sure. And Nimoy was a holdout mm. because Paramount had never paid him a dime for his image on lunch pails and all the other really? merchandise. They screwed him on the merchandise. Oh, wow. And he was asking for 50 cents a, a sure, lunchbox, right? Sure, sure. <clears throat> and they were saying, screw you. you know, we don't need Spock to do Star Trek. You know, we got Kirk. We right. We're good. And they had you. <laughs> <laughs> for for uh, a hot minute. <laughs> well, about a week into shooting the first movie, they realized, oh, you know, this doesn't make any sense. With you got to get Spock. Leonard. <laughs> Call him. They settled. They settled. They gave him a lot of money. A nice payday for Leonard. And <clears throat> Just for the, the merchandising. Just for the merchandising, right. his image. And um, so we're in the second season of In Search of, mm -hmm. and Leonard says, come on in to the studio with me and help these writers figure out how to get me back in the play. <laughs> you know, we got to get Spock back. So I would sit in his trailer at Paramount, right. invisible, unnamed, uncredited, uh, a member of the Writers Guild, right. a good union guy, <clears throat> slipping notes under the door <laughs> to the 25 writers <laughs> there who were trying to figure out. A ton of writers on those things. Um, and listening to Wise say, I don't get this. <laughs> I'm directing a robot. The guy with the ponytail is telling me where to put my actors. I don't understand. Yeah. <laughs> this was another paradigm shift. This right. was a, a, a time when animation was coming to the fore. Right. Um, acting was still important. Uh, and we, we saw... Um, that progressed to a point where acting was totally unnecessary. Arnold Schwarzenegger right. Right. came on the scene when he couldn't speak a word of English. Right. He's in movies. Right. Big time. He's naked with a spear, and there's a blonde next to him who's doing his lines. You remember the early yes. movies? Yes, yes. Thor says, no. you know, right. Conan denies your accusation, <laughs> and she's naked, and you're listening to her, and his mouth is moving. 
so the performance <laughs> meant nothing. <laughs> and now it's coming back to acting yes. again. Yes. 3D is a waste of time. This is not going what anywhere. Is it's no the, better than it was in the 50s. Right. I tell you, though, if you, if you saw the, the Scorsese movie, oh, I do Scorsese yeah. does some interesting things with 3D yeah. With, with, yeah. with Hugo. But I just don't understand what the 3D, why bring it back? It's, it's to jack ticket prices up. Ugh. It's a market marketing. Everything is 3D. Everything is 3D. Yeah. Um, but the, these are, this is what business does when it doesn't have an idea, when it doesn't have a soul, when it doesn't have a product. Yeah. Um, you don't need bells and whistles. Um, when you're making the best machine in the right. world, the right. best of anything. Sure. Um, 60 Minutes has never needed promotion. Never, ever. It just and is what it is. It has always been as and always a hit. Combined age of the <laughs> cast is 2,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, Andy's gone now. Andy's so. gone. <laughs> you know, they're dropping off. Um, uh, yeah, you know, it speaks for itself, and ultimately, that's uh, that's where you find equity right. in ideas, not uh, packaging. Did you enjoy working when you made the kind of semi transition into film? Oh, I loved it? it. I loved it, um, and it was. Uh, I thank Leonard and Alan Landsberg, who was the executive oh, yeah. producer. And I was hired under very strange circumstances. I had quit CBS in disgust. Mm. The last, uh, the first crisis, the early 70s, when it was all going to hell. And we were making too much money to be left alone. <clears throat> and I was doing independent documentaries. And I did a film on the California prison system. Mm -hmm that had no narration. It was all just people talking, prisoners and jailers and cops mm -hmm. and um, very gritty show. It was my first Emmy as a director. <clears throat> and I'm working out of uh, NBC when it had a documentary unit. <laughs> those are long gone. Long gone. We don't do those anymore. And the boss of that unit said, uh, Bob, you know, why don't you return this guy's phone call? I said, who is he? He says, well, it's Alan Landsberg. You know, he's David Walper's top guy. And he's got his own company now, and he wants to talk to you. Mm. Why don't you call him back? I said, well, I didn't know who he was. Yeah. I called him back. He, he was one of five people who saw my show. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, did you, how long did it take you to do all that? How did you do that? And I'm hired by a guy I've never met over the phone t to do In Search Of. Right. Uh, he had 100,000 feet of film that he'd shot. He'd sold it to the NBC stations. Uh, he had originally done it with Robert Vaughn. Mm -hmm. And his competitor had used Nimoy. So he was negotiating with Nimoy. Right. He said, I've got to deliver six shows in three months. Can you do that? Being ignorant of the process, I said, well, sure, "Sure, I do news. I do live. I do six hours of live television a day. I can do that. I can do that." Well, I, I did, and um, but that transition to commercial uh, standards to scripted material mm -hmm. um, was a bumpy one, uh, but great fun. And Good. Good. as you know, there you cannot have more fun in this life than stand in front of a cast and crew of 300 people and say, action. Right, and then all of a sudden you're somebody else. Um, we gotta go, but I gotta tell you, you're a classic, my friend. Thank you so much for uh, coming to the Urban Roundtable and sitting with us and, and giving us actually a, a scoop. I mean, you know, you, <laughs> you're gonna now be headed to Nappy, and we, we know all, all of that stuff. There'll be old news then. But seriously, uh, Robert Long, uh, thank you so much, my homeboy. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. <laughs> Thanks for coming. And do come again. I shall. Right on. Thanks. Thank you. My pleasure. We'll be right back.
Outland Services has had quite a vision in the waste industry, and one of the things it's been able to do is by purchasing this composting facility, this company has become one of only two certified processors for food waste for the city of LA. We have our collection vehicles that are residential and commercial. Their maximum capacity is 10 tons. We take that tonnage and we load it onto larger vehicles and we send those vehicles to the landfill, which saves us on sending the smaller vehicles up to the landfill and waiting in lines and burning fuel, which results in less carbon emissions and less costs. We work very hard at mitigating the impact. These are some of the things that we have done to be able to make sure that we do not impact the residents that are adjacent to our locations. So this building is fully enclosed. We have a filtration system on the, uh, on the roof with 10 forced air ventilation systems with carbon filters inside of them. Fast activating doors help keep any odors or dust within the facility so it doesn't affect our neighbors. It also is built in a manner so it, it blends into the community. It doesn't stand out in any manner. It just looks like a, a regular industrial business. Athens Services takes pride in its stewardship of the environment as well as the community. Athens employs people that live in the community. Approximately 400 jobs were created when this facility was, was started. It's a great company to work for, and it's a job that's not going to go away. With a lot of jobs in America, the local jobs, national jobs are going away, these jobs are not going to go away. We have over 1,100 employees, and we're creating more jobs for people as we add more facilities. We know we're reaching landfill capacity and we're not, in LA County, we're not creating any more landfills. With building more facilities, more material recovery facilities, what we're going to do is we're going to extract more material and have less material going to the landfill. We're taking responsibility for the waste that's being generated and we're finding new markets and new solutions for it.